Coming up on this week's episode of TechSnap. We air Microsoft's dirty laundry as news leaks about its less-than-stellar handling of a security database breach, plus a fascinating story of deceit, white lies, and tacos, all par for the course in the world of social engineering. And we find out about not-so-smart smart cards after it's revealed that millions of smart cards are vulnerable to a crippling cryptographic attack. Plus, your fantastic feedback, a juicy roundup, and so much more on this week's episode of TechSnap. Welcome to TechSnap, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly systems, network, and administration podcast. This is episode 342 for October 24th, 2017. This show is brought to you by our three most excellent sponsors, DigitalOcean, Ting, and IX Systems. My name is Wes, and joining me this week is the man who's mastered backups to an even further extent. I didn't even think that was possible, but it's Dan. Welcome to the show, Dan. Wonderful to have you as always. How are you doing today? Hello, Wes. I'm fine. Hello, everyone else. Um, I'm doing pretty good. Uh been spending some time on two interesting things. Uh, those of you with Macs are familiar with the time capsule that you can buy that you back up stuff into. Well, you can also provide a time machine uh, backup location off ZFS and NetTalk and stuff like that. You, you can do it all through there. And I'm having a minor problem in that it doesn't detect that it's run out of space and starts deleting old backups. It just fails. And I had some Twitter exchanges this morning, and someone sent me a rather detailed email that I'm going to go through later on. And oh, what was the nice. other thing? What was the other? Oh, yeah. Uh, and the other thing is all of this other stuff is distracting me from what I really want to be doing, which is packaging fresh ports and getting the new server ready. But What do you mean that, by packaging fresh so, ports? Um, Freshports.org is a website that I started 10 or 15 years ago, I think, and it monitors changes to the FreeBSD ports tree. So those of you that are older will recall a website called freshmeat.net. This is like fresh pe- freshmeat.net, but 100% automated. Uh, no one goes there and types in descriptions of what the changes are. And it was a couple of years ago that the website front-end code got put into GitHub. Um, but what I'm doing now is with the new server, instead of doing an SVN up or a git pull to refresh the software, I'm actually using FreeBSD packages. So if I ever put those packages in the FreeBSD ports tree, the website would become self-aware and it would be reporting upon changes to itself. Ooh, I like it. That's that, that's really meta. And it's it's no. beautiful. Have to, have to be careful not to collapse the universe. Well, yeah, I mean, we only have the one universe, at least as far as I'm aware, and yes. I'm certainly enjoying it, so please be respectful. Yes, yes I will. Sounds like some good uh, some good labors, though. Um, it, it, it is a lot of fun. I'd rather be doing that than... Than dealing, getting all the time machine stuff set up correctly. Yeah, yeah. But, but once both, you've done both it... Both are good. Yeah. Both are good. And it both seems like you good. have a lot of Macs around you, uh, you know, for work or personal, so it'd be, you know, it'd probably probably nice to have that really dialed in. Yeah, right. Just look around. You're filled with them. How many is that? Four. Boy. Yeah. And I told you I got the new um, MacBook Pro yeah, for work. Yeah, look at that. That is very nice. Um, I really like it. It's the one with the touch bar. and a lot of people saying the touch bar is no good. But um, I like it so much, I'm thinking of replacing this MacBook Air with it. So if anyone's looking for a secondhand MacBook Air... Excellent. Yeah, there yeah. we go. Shout out to the audience. Uh, you know where to find him, everyone. Okay, so uh, I guess with that out of the way, we can jump right into today's oh. awesome, excellent show. Oh, but not quite yet. What's that, Mr. Dan? No, I was just looking and saying, oh, yeah, we have a show to do. Oh, we do have a show to do, and yep, it looks yep, like a yep, great yep. one. We've got tons of cool yep. stuff to talk about. Um, so first up, I guess we'll jump over to my friends over in Redmond, very different from the Cupertino world. And here's an exclusive from our friends at Reuters. Microsoft responded quietly after detecting secret database hack in 2013. What's going on here, Dan? I found it interesting that both big companies are headquartered there and almost in the same town. It's 
it's you know there's states apart, but I consider that to be all the same town. It's all the anyway, same to you. It's all it's just one big town. The West Coast is yep, all just it's one all big one. Town. We just hang out all together. We're eating tacos. It's pretty great. Write your hate mail now. Uh, Microsoft Corp's secret internal database for tracking bugs in its own software was broken into by a highly sophisticated hacking group more than four years ago, according to five former employees, in only the second known breach of such a corporate database. Now, we uh, highly sophisticated hacking group. We'll get to that later, but um, it is sophisticated and uh, – Intelligence sources cannot decide upon whether or not it's uh, a state actor or not. Uh, or um, there's, there's always controversy amongst proving who a state actor is, but you always have ideas and suspicions. Um, some of them, some of them work normal office hours, like they're always active. You know, between this time period, and if you take that to a normal office day, you sort of know they're somewhere in this part right. of the world. You're like, okay, that looks like it's uh, this place on the globe. Mm -hmm. You probably work yep. for so and so government, or at least it like lines up an area that that they could yep. be from. And, and it's interesting that they're only act. Some of these groups are only active during office hours. Outside office hours, nothing happens. Yeah. It's, you know, the company did not disclose the extent of the attack to the public or its customers after its discovery in 2013, but the five former employees described it to Ro I always have trouble to Reuters in separate interviews. Microsoft de declined to discuss the incident. Now, it, it would be one thing if these five employees were all interviewed together, but if they're interviewed separately, maybe they get their stories really good, but. Yeah, uh, right. Yeah, exactly. I, 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 or they could just be telling the truth. You or never they, know. Or they could be telling the truth. Yeah, you're yes. right. But it does. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, it does shed some light on that. Sometime after learning of the attack, Microsoft went back and looked at breaches of other organizations around them. The five X employees said it found no evidence that the stolen information has been used in these breaches. Later on, we'll find that lack of evidence is not evidence that it did not happen. <laughs> Two current employees said the company stands by that assessment. Three of the former employees assert the study had too little data to be conclusive. Microsoft tightened up security after the breach, the former employees said, walling the database off from the corporate network and requiring two authentications for access. So it's totally separate from the corporate network. And that sort of makes sense. Not everyone in the corporation needs to get access to that database. Yeah, no, definitely not. In fact, uh, especially at a company that size, very few people need access to that database out mm -hmm. of the total. Mm -hmm. Now, only one breach of such a big, uh, only one breach of a big database from a software company has been disclosed. Huh. And that was Mozilla Foundation in 2015. Oh, yeah, okay, they I do, remember that. They, they do Fire, Firefox, et cetera. An attacker had gotten access to a database that included 10 severe and unpatched flaws. One of those flaws was then leveraged in, a, in an attack on Firefox users. Uh, Mozilla disclosed that at the time. I, I don't remember this incident, but it doesn't mean it didn't happen. No. So, uh, in contrast to Microsoft's approach, Mozilla provided extensive details of the breach and urged its customers to take action. So, uh, now, yes, but the alarm spread after an internal probe. Microsoft discovered the database breach in early 2013 after a highly skilled hacking group broke into computers at a number of major tech companies, including Apple Inc., Facebook Inc. and Twitter Inc. The group, variously called Morpho, Butterfly, and Wild Neutron by security researchers elsewhere, exploited a flaw in the Java programming language to penetrate employees' Apple Macintosh computers and then move to company networks. So what flaw in Java... Pro it, 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 I always think that maybe it's being misinterpreted by the reporters when they say exploited a flaw in the Java programming language. Was it a flaw in the in Java? Was it a flaw in the program they were running? Yeah. 
Or it, was it actually a flaw in the JVM? It's very unclear. There's like a lot of things associated there. Mm-hmm. It doesn't doesn't mm-hmm. really give us a lot of information. Mm-hmm. The hack remain the group remains active as one of the most proficient and mysterious mm-hmm. hacking groups known to be in operation, according to security researchers. Experts cannot agree about whether it is backed by a national government, let alone which national government. Sounds like they're doing a good job of uh, covering at least some of their tracks then. Mm-hmm. So, more than a week after stories about the breaches first appeared in 2013, Microsoft published a brief statement that per- tor- uh, excuse me, portrayed its own break-in as limited and made no reference to the bug database. I can see why they wouldn't want to do that. Um, So we found a small number of computers, including some in our Mac business unit, that were infected by malicious software using techniques similar to to those documented by the other organizations. We have no evidence of customer data being affected, and our investigation is ongoing. Well, truthfully, the bug database is not necessarily customer data. It could contain customer data, but it's not customer's data anymore. Um, Inside the company, Microsoft, alarm spread as officials realized the database for tracking patches had been compromised, according to the five former security employees. That's the first time they've mentioned that they were security employees. Yeah, we're learning a little bit more there. They were just employees before. They said the database was poorly protected with little, with access possible via little more than a password. So now we're getting to the end of the article, and this is where it sort of gets rough and tumble. Concerns that hackers were using stolen bugs to conduct new attacks prompted Microsoft to prepare to compare the timing of those breaches with when the flaws had entered the database and when they were patched according to the employees. These people said the study concluded that even though the bugs in the database were used in ensuing hacking attacks, their perpetrators could have gotten the information elsewhere. Yes, that is possible. <laughs> but but that finding helped justify Microsoft's decision not to disclose the breach, the employees said, former employees. And in many cases, patches had already been released to its customers. Three of the five former employees said the study could not rule out stolen bugs having used in follow-on attacks. And I agree with that. They absolutely discovered that bugs had been taken. So that's solid. Whether or not those bugs were in use, I don't think they did a very thorough job of discovering. And then this last paragraph explains why. That's partly because Microsoft relied on automated reports from software crashes to tell when attacks started showing up. Okay. The problem with this approach, some security experts say, is that most sophisticated attacks do not cause crashes. And the most targeted machines, such as those with sensitive government information, are the least likely to allow automated reporting. Definitely the case. So, it is interesting. It may have been used. It may not have been used. There's no proof one way or the other. So, they did, they, they did see these exploits, uh, these vulnerabilities being exploited, but they couldn't prove that it had come from information based... Uh, they couldn't conclude that it had come from information gained in that breach. Right. So, but they can't prove it, but they can't not prove but it. But you can't not prove it. Yeah, right, exactly. You're kind of sitting in the middle ground where, well, we we had this information, and it was possible that they could have gained access to yeah, it during yeah. this breach. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. They can always contact the security group, the, <laughs> right, yeah. you know, the bad actors, and ask them, where did you get this information from? Hey, guys, from, uh, just kind of curious. Do you mind sharing the details about how you learned our secrets? They've got Twitter accounts. They'll answer you. Yeah, sure. Just be polite or, you know, troll them. But either way, it'll probably work. Yeah. And no, they don't have Twitter accounts. 
Hmm. Well, this is this is like an interesting development, and it's also I'm I'm glad Mozilla was set up here as like a pretty good example of you know, you know what what they did, especially when you're a big vendor of a lot of software and you have a lot of you know sensitive information that needs to be disclosed responsibly or not, or you know depending on on what it is, who it pertains to, and who's vulnerable as a result of it. Um, and it's it's wor- a little bit worrying that we're only just hearing about it now. Yeah, I'm. It's interesting. I'd like to know how uh, Reuters tracked down these folks. I would like to what know that as well. What prompted the interview? Maybe yes. some good old-fashioned uh, journalism up in here. It could be. Could be. Where, where's that coming from? I'm not sure. Uh, hmm. Okay, well, anything else you want to chime in here about uh, Microsoft's security foibles? As always, patch early, patch often. There we go. And make sure you have, uh, you know, sophisticated protections for your most vulnerable and valuable systems. That's, uh, that's important, yes. too. Okay. Yes. Well, after this, you may be thinking, mm, I'm not sure that I, how much I, I trust Microsoft or some of these other large companies with my data and my workloads. Thankfully, these days, we have an alternative, especially if we're talking about cloud hosting. My friends, head on over to DigitalOcean.com to find cloud computing designed for developers whether you're sick and tired of having to jumble through confusing uis horribly designed apis or you just want to try something new DigitalOcean is the place to beat starting at just five dollars a month you can get started with a cloud vps of your very own they call them droplets and i like the name it's pretty fun basically it's a real vm running on their beautiful meticulous infrastructure prices start at just five dollars a month and with that you get i mean pretty much everything you need, right? Whether you want to run FreeBSD, Container Linux, Ubuntu, Debian, they've got all kinds of options, pretty much every OS that you're going to want to use. And because they use real KVM virtualization, if they don't have the OS that suits you, maybe you're an OpenBSD fan, there's steps online, yes, unofficial, but there's steps online to go convert a droplet to whatever OS you want to run. They've got an HTML5 serial console, so if you need to get in there and do some debugging the hard way, that's totally an option. Some of their bigger competitors don't have that, and I have to say, well, you shouldn't have to be in that position. When you are, it's really handy. Not only that, but we've got a super secret, super special promo code over DigitalOcean. Yeah, that's right. Snap. Ocean. One word, all lowercase, Snap Ocean. That's going to get you started with a $10 credit after you sign up. Sign up first, then use the promo code, then start playing around. So go check out their pricing page and you'll see what I'm talking about here because it's simple, transparent pricing. And that's a theme at DigitalOcean. Everything is simple and transparent. It's incredible. Some of these other places, you have like external third party tools to try to calculate what your expected bill will be, or you have to go through like really extraneous workflows just to set up some sort of automated billing alert system. That's kind of nonsense. At DigitalOcean, they do the opposite approach and they start simple and they keep it simple. So droplets, as I was saying, they're starting just $5 a month. That's 512 MB of memory, one virtual CPU. It's no slouch. 20 gigs of all SSD disk. And DigitalOcean was one of the first cloud providers to recognize that SSDs were the future. So they started all SSD and they've continued all SSD. You don't have no slow magnetic spinning disks, none of that rotating rust. You just get pure, fast, beautiful SSD. So you won't ever have to wait. On top of that, they have some of the best networking prices in the biz. You get a whole one terabyte of transfer. One terabyte of transfer. It's incredible. It's awesome. It's no nonsense. It's great pairing, great transit. Just go spin up a new Ubuntu box, do a couple pseudo app get updates, upgrades. You'll see just like these systems fly. You can be pretty sure that you're going to get all the iApps and all the network bandwidth that you need for whatever you're doing, whether that's a new startup, your own open source project, just hosting a next cloud or a VPN up there. Tons of great use cases. Maybe you'll need a little bit more. They've also got hourly pricing. So let's say you just want to, you know, go compile a bunch of kernels. You're trying to do some, uh, you know, some machine learning or just big data. Not a problem. Go spin up one of their one of their more fancy options here. For just less than one dollar an hour, you can get 64 gigs of memory, 20 virtual CPUs, 640 gigs of SSD disk, and a whopping nine terabytes of transfer. Not only that, but DigitalOcean's got a great community, just chock full of Jupyter Broadcasting members, a ton of other people in it with a similar mindset, open source enthusiasts, doers, makers, creators. They're all there. 
head on over to their community page. They they take community contributions. They hire real editors to just turn all these things into some of the top-notch documentation you're going to find on the web. At this point, you've probably already run into a few DigitalOcean articles. If you're trying to Google how to do something in open source, especially on Ubuntu or some of the more popular server platforms, DigitalOcean is bound to have an article. So, you know, they don't, you don't have to be on DigitalOcean to use those articles, but you might as well be, especially with all these benefits. Plus, right now, receive free access to services including monitoring, cloud firewalls, and more. They're always launching more services, things like high CPU droplets, things like free private networking. So if you have two droplets in the same data center, you don't pay for the networking between them. Boom! Super simple. And they just launched Spaces, which is an object storage system. Maybe you've tried some of their competitors. They've got they've got compatible APIs, but Spaces is just like Dio, Dio would be super simple, super easy to use, and no nonsense. It really is cloud computing designed for developers. So don't waste any more time. Head on over to DigitalOcean.com. Use our promo code SnapOcean and get started with the best darn cloud provider you're gonna find. Thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring us here at the TechSnap program. Okay, so with that out of the way, I think we get to move on to uh, what might be the most fun article of the day. I don't know. They're all great today. I'm not going to judge, but I do like this next one because today we're talking about some social engineering. And it reads like a comedy, like a romantic comedy or something in terms of how this happens. And it's fairly easy. It's just very small steps. It's not like someone knocked on the door and said, can I come in? But that's what it amounts to. That's about it, yeah. So the title of this article is How I Socially Engineer Myself into High Security Facilities. Hello, my name is Sophie, and I break into buildings. I I get paid to think like a criminal. Organizations hire me to evaluate the security, which I can do by seeing if I can bypass it. During tests, I get to do some lock picking, climb over walls or hot barred wire fences. I get to go dumpster diving and play with all sorts of cool gadgets that Q would be proud of. But usually I use what is called social engineering to convince employees to let me in. Sometimes I use email or phone calls to pretend to be someone I am not. Most often I get to approach people in person and give them the confidence to let me in. My frequently asked questions include, what break-in are you most proud of? What have you done for a test that you were the most ashamed of? And what follows is the answer to both of those questions. There's so much in this article that, I, that I'm going to wind up reading almost the whole thing. And I, 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 because it's just so wonderful to read. So right into it. This facility had armed guards, badge readers, biometric security controls, and turnstiles at every entrance. That sounds like a third-party uh, data center. Like yes, they it provide does. facilities for, for d- data centers, but we don't know. I remember thinking, it's going to be hell to work in there. I wonder if I can use that. One thing was for sure, the chances of tailgating following behind an employee with valid credentials into this building were next to non-existent. That really does sound like a data center. First stop, LinkedIn. Your LinkedIn is my best friend. The more information you have in your LinkedIn, the more options I have. I have several fake LinkedIn profiles that you're probably connected to. Well, probably not directly connected to because I only... (laughs) connect to LinkedIn profiles of people I've, I've actually worked with. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good policy. Yeah. Uh, he, hello, I'm Dan, and I'd like to connect with you on LinkedIn. No. Uh. I, scour, I scour profiles of employees who work at these facilities and cross-reference them to other social media sites. And I find a lovely young woman who I'm going to call Mary. Mary was a brand new hire working as an assistant at the manufacturing facility, so maybe it's not a data center; it's manufacturing. But sort of similar physical, uh, you know, yes. impediments going on yes. here. I wonder what they're manufacturing. I that's too. So secure. Mary had a public Facebook account too. Side note: Now I know where Mary went to high school, her mother's maiden name, the names of her pets, etc. Answers to these no security kidding. questions you use to reset your passwords are very easy to find if you aren't careful with that information. I wish to interject here. Never answer these questions truthfully. 
Use a password manager. Make up your own answers to these questions. Make them random strings of characters and avoid this exact situation. Okay. Mary, go, uh, uh, sorry, Sophie goes on to explain, this is not an advanced investigation. I'm not a private eye, and I don't have the resources of the NSA. Ha, 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 ha. But I can do a lot of damage with simple methods. Most, most notably to me, there were photos of Mary posted of her time volunteering with a certain maternity support center. Her passion for children and caring new moms was very plain. So, of course, I took advantage of it. Doom, doom, doom. For this assessment, I played two roles. First, I spoofed my phone number to make it look like it was coming from the company's headquarters. I called the front desk of the manufacturing facility and was transferred to Mary. Hi, Mary. My name is Barbara. Remember, the author here is Sophie. I am a project coordinator with facilities management. We are renovating a few of our facilities. Uh -oh. We are sending an interior designer out to you tomorrow so she can put together proposals to update your space. Who wouldn't want new space? Yeah, I want that too. Can they send them right over? I don't care if you're real. Just I, I, it sounds I, great. I'm sure they'll be there. But you have a good space. Oh, you mean at home? Yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry. Mary replied, well, that's great. But why the short notice? I could feel her getting suspicious. So I pulled out my trump card. Bad choice of words. Sigh. Well, Mary, you really should have heard from me sooner. I've just been so overloaded at work. I feel like I can't catch up. And to top it off, the baby is due in six weeks. If my boss finds out I mess this up, he's going to flip. I was really getting into this, voice shaking. Yes, I know. I'm a terrible human <laughs> being. She cut me off. Oh, honey, honey, it's okay. We'll, we will work this out. Tell me about the baby. Is it your first boy or girl? Our Mary was committed at this point, not because she's stupid, but because she's a good person. I think that's she such a great to point, help me. right? Like, it is. That is, it is. That is how people naturally respond, especially when you're not, you know, you may not be security trained. You're not necessarily told mm -hmm. that your role is to be the enforcer of security. You have other people mm -hmm. who that is delegated to. So you're just thinking like, you know, once mm -hmm. that trust, you just need that little bit of trust in there and all the walls evaporate. Exactly. We talked babies and birth plans for a while. Never pick a pretext you can't talk about at length. Mary took the, down the name of the designer who was coming by the next day, and we said our goodbyes. Mary could have saved her company a lot of heartache simply by verifying that I was who I claimed to be. Just to be clear here, I would never give out Mary's real identity. I'm not totally heartless. This could have happened to anyone. She has not been fired. Okay. I show up the next day as Claire with a fictional architecture firm that I made business cards and a website for. My alter ego, Barb, had done most of the legwork for me. When I arrived, Mary and her boss were waiting for me with smiles. I shook hands all around and handed them the business card I printed out the night before. I was given a visitor badge and the red carpet was rolled out. We'll get back to this uh, entry point later. I gained rapport with the staff by asking them to tell me what they wanted in an office space. They were so excited. I might have claimed to be on the team that put together the Google offices. Yes, I am horrible. This is my inner demon child. We became, we became best buds. I was given complete and unaccompanied, uh, unaccompanied access to the facility where I stayed for several hours. I gained network access and stole several thousands of dollars in physical primitives. I'm not sure what they mean by that. Maybe it's a manufacturing thing. By picking my way through cheap locks. I've always wanted to learn to lock pick. Yeah, it seems like a very nice uh, distracting hobby, even if you don't end up using it for anything. And then, yeah. best case, well, hey, you do. When you look at the videos of it, the little diagrams, I said, oh, is it as easy as that? Really? Really? Yeah. Huh. Let me try I also kind of have an idle hand, so like, uh, you know, I like doing things like you know, solving a Rubik's Cube, or I've yep. done like various knitting, or you know, anything that will just like use your hands, and that seems like a great one. Just you're at your desk, you're working on something else, you need a distraction, sit there. You pick can do it box. on the do it on the train, yeah, do train, it on the, the plane, bus, totally. Yeah. Yeah. This client had been pretty confident that I wouldn't get into either facility, much less be able to hit both in a short time span. So the timeline was left to my discretion, but it was assumed, but it was assumed that I would need to the, 
to fly to the area twice. Huh. I didn't see the need in burdening them with two round trip expenses. Well, that's nice. That is very nice. It's very considerate. Mm-hmm. I went back to Mary's office and said, well, I think I have what I need from here. Dun, dun, dun. How do I get to the office center? She looked at her watch and said, it's almost lunchtime. I'll take you there. A whole group of us piled into the parking lot and they took me to a nearby taco shop. That's right. My marks took me to get tacos. I love my job. What? I want some tacos. That sounds great. It does. I took forever looking around this office space, and eventually they said their goodbyes because they had to go back to work. They had a strict policy of escorting visitors, but I had been seen walking around with trusted insiders, so no one questioned me. I was free to take my time. I made myself at home. My main objective at this site was to weasel my way into private corner offices. When I accomplished my goals, I tracked down my point of contacts office. This is the man who hired me in the first place. This is the best part of every job. Steve was there, hard at work, when I disturbed his groove by knocking on the door. He glanced up. Hi there. How can I help you? I smiled. Hi, Steve. I'm Sophie from Sincerely Security. It's nice to meet you in person. I will never forget the look in his face. Pure gold. Who? Wait, what? How how did you get in here? Oh, that is just... That is beautiful. That must be such a great moment. Yep. (laughs) And that like stomach sinking feeling that surely Steve had just like, Oh, shit. Yeah. We stayed in his office and talked for a long time. I went over exactly the steps that could have prevented my success. First of all, the desire to help others is human and natural. We don't want to discourage that. Second, I'm sure they did have some sort of policy that required visitors to check in showing government-issued ID, but they weren't following it. We also need to post by every computer, phone, and door. Trust, but verify. An employee who does their homework can ruin my day. Third, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Lastly, the team who took me to the second location should have found someone else to escort me through the building. So if anyone, and that that's basically her, her summary of what went wrong. but And she finishes with saying, there are ways to protect yourself and your company from attacks like this. I think it starts by sharing stories like these and educating and empowering each other to be vigilant. It, so if Mary or our boss had a called head office and verified that someone was coming over, wouldn't have happened. Yeah, right. If they had to ask for government ID when they came in, oh, this doesn't match your name. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, and I think a lot uh, of it comes down to, yep. you know, being able to, um, you know, you do need that, like, blessing from the organization in terms of, like, you know, I can see in some orgs, sure, you you, you delayed the designer who was yep. coming over because you were asking them questions, and mm-hmm. you get yelled at. But if you're, you know, if you can be assured that that's what management wants, that those are best practices that you're following, yep. then you're not worried so much about the, like, social repercussions of being like, hey, wait a minute, who are you? What are you doing? Can you, uh, can you show yeah, me your badge? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, speaking of badge... Uh, sometimes I drive down to the office, which is about two hours drive away. And I get up about five 30 and get down there about seven 30 with bagels, bagel <laughs> Monday guys. And can I work at your office? That sounds great. Dan. It's wonderful. Bagels. Bagels are from Einstein bagels. Oh yeah. Those and are good. I, I, I bring down two bags worth of them every time I go down. So one day, one trip, I'm sure at least more than one trip, I've forgotten my badge. So, there's no one there that I can knock on a door or anything because everything's locked. And there's no – when I get there, reception isn't open and they don't have spare badges anyway. So I don't you know, say, hey, listen, can you let me in as people coming through? But I'm sitting on the floor outside the locked door, getting out my laptop, connecting to the Wi-Fi, getting on instant messaging and say, hey, the bagels are here. Can someone come and let me in? And – that gets me in the door. Now, presumably, the people that are letting me in the door know that it's Dan and that it's me and I'm bringing in bagels, but... <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Uh, I wonder I wonder if I've just opened ourselves up. 
yeah, we know that we know your employer. We know, well, I don't know your offices, but uh, I'll just walk around with bagels for a while. And I'm sure I'll get into some office because who doesn't want yeah. bagels? I know I do. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, that would be a horrible thing to have happen. It it really would. But it's good. You know, it's, it's actually nice to hear, too, even if there was, you know, a number of failures here. It's also just nice to see, like, here's a company that's being proactive about it. Here they've hired, you know, they've hired mm-hmm. her services, her company, to try to go infiltrate, to do these things. And that's important, especially if you do have guarantees. You've signed contracts with your, you know, the people you're doing business with that say that you have these. And then they're relying that downstream. They've signed contracts with their customers saying that their manufacturing facilities meet these standards, etc. So it really is good to see, you know, yes, you have failures, but... That's part of the process. Now you can go remediate those, work on your process, do more education, and uh, do it again. Yeah. Um, I, I hope that I never fall victim to this because it is it is kind of embarrassing, but Definitely. we'll see. And we'll it is see. like those social pressures. It sounds so silly, but those social pressures really are worrisome especially if you're in you know especially if you're new you're not necessarily in a position of power here's someone mm-hmm. who seems very official who's you know especially if they have like an air of busyness or importance or know where they're going um it can, it can take a little bit of uh you know courage and self-assuredness to be like stop you can go almost anywhere with a clipboard yeah and a toolbox Exactly. Uh, I just wanted to add that uh, I thought this article was great. So uh, if you want to go see more of her work, you can go follow her on Twitter there. Uh, Yes. It's at the bottom of the article. You can find her her Twitter account. Anything you wanted to add about this whole ordeal? Uh, Yeah, I hope, like I said before, I hope this never happens to me. It would be so easy. We'll see, Dan. Maybe you'll be seeing me in person sometime real soon. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. How did you get in here? <laughs> That's my little secret. Uh, okay, well, great. That was that was fascinating. That's really made my whole day, maybe my week. Uh, and now maybe you're a little bit concerned about just the people you're doing businesses, what their security practices are, and you're getting a little paranoid about running all of your stuff on other people's computers. Well, my friends, if you're looking for some top-notch hardware, there's no place better. Then IX Systems. Head on over to ixsystems.com slash techsnap. There you will find a definitive guide to buying hardware for open source software. It's a great white paper. Read it. Maybe present it to people, you know, whether you're looking for new hardware or the people at your company, people who are responsible for procurement, vendor relationships, that sort of thing. Go drop that on their desk. I think a lot of people are frustrated. I know I've certainly been been in positions with some of these big name retailers where you just want support. You just want to actually, you know, interface with a human, feel like your 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 voices, your concerns are being heard, acknowledged, and that you have like a relationship that you can that you can work with a real human that understands your need, and it's not just some you know part number or some OEM ID that you have to make sure is there and jump through a thousand hoops and open six different tickets just to get a response to your service request. None of that happens with iX systems. They are really a different breed. Whether you need the latest and greatest Intel hardware processors, the whole kit, whether you need to make sure that you have the specific motherboard that that will work with the chassis that you need, that'll fit in the, the available rack space that you have in your data center. Regardless, iX Systems has a great staff of super talented sales engineers standing by, ready to assist you. They want to be your partner. And that's really where the difference comes from. They're not just here to sell you stuff. They're here to make you successful. They're here to see that your new projects are great, that your startup succeeds, that your new, you know, whatever infrastructure you're needing to run, whether the SAN in your corporate data center is going to be top notch, that's what they're interested in. So whether or not you're an expert in, you know, SAS expanders, uh, server level motherboards, any of it. You don't have to be. Sure, if you are, that's great. And I think they'll be thrilled to hear from you. Give them a call today. Go chat with some fellow nerds. That's going to be fun too. But if you're not and you just want to, you know, you you see and recognize quality and you want and you need, you know, good deals, reliable hardware, hardware that's been burn in tested. That's one thing about IX as well that really sets them apart is that they know, they follow the industry, they know that hard drives are most likely to fail in the first couple of days, you know, within the first X number of hours of use. So they burn them in for you. You don't see it. It doesn't just show up at your data center dead, lifeless. No, they've already burned it in, they've tested it, and they've configured the system however you need. So, you know, give them the image that you want, they'll apply it, tell them how you need your software configured, not a problem. They'll ship it right to the data center, it shows up, gets racked, plugged in, and bam, 
you have your new server. It's just that simple. Maybe you don't need a server. Maybe you just need storage. Dan's gotten to you. You're really concerned about your backups. You're like, oh, I've got all these Macs. I don't know what I'm going to do. I have all these servers. I don't have enough room for a tape drive, even though Dan's almost convinced me of that too. Well, my friends, there is a solution, and that is the FreeNAS Mini. The FreeNAS Mini is awesome. It's just like the perfect get out of jail free card. You feel guilty. You, you know that your spouse's pictures aren't really backed up the way that they should be. You don't want to lose the pictures of the kids or your important tax documents, and you just don't have the skills, or maybe you don't have the time. I know I certainly don't always have the time to do things properly. FreeNAS Mini will just take that burden right off of you. It's that simple. You can buy it right on Amazon if you have Prime or buy it straight from iX. Give them a call. Go to their website. Yeah, they have a website too. I, calling them is probably best because you get to talk to an awesome human being. But either way, FreeNAS has been polished for years now. They provide and work on the upstream open source software FreeNAS, which is great. You can install it on your own hardware if you want to go through that. Or you get to benefit from the awesome hardware they put together. They've been doing this th for years through dot-com bubbles, bursts, the whole ordeal, and they really know what makes a reliable system. You know, things like ensuring that all the data is stored in in your data pool so that the actual FreeNAS operating system just boots from a USB drive attached to the motherboard. If you need to, you can just open that up, switch it out, reflash it with the latest FreeNAS, boot it right back up. You don't have to worry about these things dying because they have been engineered to be reliable. It's the kind of stuff you can just buy one or buy two, drop it in your home office or your small office network. Boom, you now have a brand new NAS, super simple to set up backup, super reliable, and there's industry-grade expert help available if you need it. Another thing that sets iX apart. So go check out iX Systems. You really will not be disappointed. And make sure you go check out some of their social media because they're always doing fun things. They really are a community member. They go to a bun bunch of conferences, things like the Ohio Linux Fest, Euro BSD Con, and they frequently post some of the beautiful machines. They have things like the TrueNAS and you know, server grade, enterprise grade, terabytes, petabytes of storage systems they've made some from some of their awesome partners. Things like University of Berkeley, Berkeley, places like JPL and NASA, government agencies, some of the people who really have the biggest data needs in the industry. That's who IX works with, and you can work with them too. So ixsystems.com slash techsnap, that'll get you started. Go check it out. Thank you to IX for sponsoring us and if you do get some shiny new iX systems, make sure you share it with us too, because we would be fascinated to know. Okay, so we've got one more story in today's main segment. Only one? Only one. Only one. I know. I just want TechSnap to go on for hours, but if we stay here and talk about everything we want to, we'll be here all darn day. Yeah. This last one, though, uh, might, might affect you, might affect something right in your pocket. A crippling crypto weakness, say that three times fast, opens millions of smart, code, smart cards to cloning. Uh-oh, that sounds bad. Smart cards are, you know, kind of used in a lot of these sort of security procedures that we were just talking about with the last story, and they're assumed to be somewhat tr trustworthy. But there's also a link to the first story. Is that right? Very tenuous, very tenuous, but... Do tell, Dan. Do tell. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know when we get to that part. So, uh, I'm going to read the f first part of this article, and then I'm going to jump through to another article just to put it in a disclaimer from the company in question, just because I think that's, f that's fair in this case. So, uh, the title of this article on Ars Technica is Crippling Crypto Weakness opens millions of smart cards to cloning. So the critical vulnerability, which researchers discovered last week, allows attackers to derive the private portion of any vulnerable key using nothing more than the corresponding public portion. So let, let's go into some background about what they're talking about here. They're talking about public and private keys. Um, this is a, a very standard way of, of doing encryption. Um, your uh, SSH key has a public part and a private part. And the public part you can put on uh, hosts that you're going to SSH to. And that's what that host will encrypt stuff in going to you. Uh, it identifies you because it, it only has one. A given public key can only have one private key. In general, that's the theory. That's what it's all based on. 
Right. And this has been a so, huge important thing, uh, you know, in the computer yes. industry yeah. in general, in that you no longer have yeah. to use sym- symmetric encryption for, you know, these sorts of things where you had to have a pre-shared yeah. key or otherwise. And the problem with symmetric encryption is that if you use the same thing to encrypt as decrypt, then anyone that gets your encryption key can also decrypt it. Exactly. So it means there's n- it, it's very hard to secure it. it, it it's like... Uh, it's like there's a really good analogy with keys and locks and boxes and stuff like that, but we'll get too sidetracked. So if you want to learn up more about that, read into that. But basically, the private key you keep secure. Generally, it's only on your laptop, doesn't go anywhere else. Some people may go extreme and have it only on a USB key, right. stuff like that. But your public key can go anywhere because it's public. It doesn't matter who sees that. That's the theory. That's the idea, so, yeah. So. The so-called factorization attack can be cl- completed in minutes or days, and the price can range from nothing, depending on the key size and type of computer an attacker uses, to $20,000. The vulnerability stems from a widely deployed library used by German chi- sorry, chip maker Infineon, which in turn sells its hardware and software to third-party smart card and device manufacturers. This isn't the first time this year that we've heard about a third-party library falling victim to this. Um, I forget what the actual product was, but it's within the past 10 or 15 episodes. The defect has been confirmed to affect the first line of Gemalto IDPrime.net smart cards. The, The cards have been on the market since 2004 at the latest, when Gemalto predecessor, Alaxto, announced Microsoft employees were using the card to secure access to the software maker's network. There's your tie-in to the previous one. By, among other things, providing two-factor authentication to company employees worldwide. And this two-factor authentication, you see it all the time. People get, a get uh, say, like Google Auth or Authy or 2STP. Uh, is it 2STP that is now? Um, are you familiar with that uh, author with that auth key thing? It, it's a, it's an iPhone app, but the author has recently taken a job with Apple, and Apple employees, as a matter of policy, are not allowed to have things in the App Store. So there'll be is no more right? updates. Yeah, there'll be no more updates for that app, um, but you can continue to use it. So this sounds like I'm going to have to change to Authy, I think. But this 2STP, I think that's the right name of the app, Mm -hmm. uh, will, there's a very good export function, one of which includes displaying a barcode for your code. So you could just barcode it into your other device. Oh, nice. Yeah, that sounds pretty It should be very easy to do it, yeah. So you just have to sit down and spend an hour or two. I have a feeling that what I'm going to have to do is take a picture with one phone, then swap over to the app, take the picture with the other phone, and... (laughs) Yeah, sit down, put put a a movie on, just go through, and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I may... I, I do have a couple of extra spare phones here, so maybe I'll be able to have the same app on both and go through it that way. But it's like the we'll, old days we'll when you had to con- we'll you know, like move contacts when you got a new phone. Yes, a bit like that. Um, back to this. So cryptography experts, however, said there is little doubt the line of Demalto cards is affected. Uh, the CEO of Enigma Bridge said he examined 11 ID Prime .net cards issued from 2008 through earlier this year. All of them used an underlying public key that tested positive for the crippling weaknesses. So it's beginning to sound like it's a a weakness in the key generation. And we'll get to that later down. By running the public keys through an attack hosted on Amazon Web Services or similar cloud computing platform, the private portions could be computed in a matter of hours for 1224 bit keys and in a matter of days for 2048 bit keys 
once attackers know the secret key, they could cryptographically clone the card. Attackers could also compromise any keys that were generated by the smart cards. So what does this give them? It's just a smart card, right? But remember, these smart cards are used for two-factor authentication. So if you steal the, the login and password for one of these employees and you have their card, you can now get in, in there with this two-factor authentication. Boom. Yeah, there you go. The paragraph is titled Keys to the Kingdom. So this uh, this person we were just talking about, the C CEO of Enigma Bridge, said members of the research team discovered the flaw and they went on to obtain two R RSA keys with a length of 512 bytes that were generated by separate ID prime.net cards. His team was able to calculate the secret key for both of them, one in about three minutes and the other in about 10 minutes using a general purpose computer. But 512 bits is way deprecated, long deprecated. Even 1024 is, is, I think, is not good enough. However, I have heard that using 4098-bit SSH keys leave you too vulnerable for a different type of attack. Uh, Colin Percival mentioned that, so oh, I went back to, to 2048 keys. If you can find so, that for the future, I'd, I'd love to... to I think it might have just been on IRC or Got it. something like that. It wasn't a blog post that I read. The vulnerability resides in all RSA keys generated by the faulty Infineon library. Do not wrap your own crypto. Here they use someone else's, but they wrap their own. To optimize speed, the library uses a structure of underlying prime numbers that makes the keys much more susceptible to a mathematical process known as factorization. Optimizing speed when it comes to cryptology is not a good idea, I'm sure. I'm not a cryptographer. I just play one in the movies, but I'm sure it's not a good idea. Identifying affected keys is quick and inexpensive and requires only access to a public key. Attackers can then run all vulnerable public keys through, a, 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 through an attack, dubbed Return of the Coppersmith Attack, or ROCA, for the type of factorization it uses. Once, it, once, once you've done this factorization, the attackers have access to the private key, and Bob's your uncle. The attack, was, the attack on the vulnerability were originally discovered by Slovak and Czech Slovak and Czech researchers in the Czech Republic, a Negra Bridge in Cambridge, and a university in Italy. They said other lines of uh, Jamalto smart cards, including the ID Prime MD, are not vulnerable. Hmm, that's interesting. So then basically they go on to say, well, you better figure out what you're going to do with these cards if you're using them. But I'd say stop using them as soon as you can. Uh, and apparently, British Sky Broadcasting Group recently deployed 4,000 vulnerable cards. What could go wrong? What could possibly go wrong? Nothing. Not, not a thing. Not a thing. Certainly not, so, you know, various levels of trust that have now, you know, this has become a dedicated part of their system. wonder how they're grabbing the public keys, though. Yeah, it seems like at some level, like, you need a little bit of... I suppose there's various threat models where that would work. I'd have to think about it a little bit more. Um, but yeah, go go check your devices. Uh, oh, oh, I know. The public key infrastructure many companies may use to encrypt email. Oh yeah. So the public key is out there. Yeah, definitely. Right. And then okay, if you sorry. have, you know, if you're if you are targeting a, an individual, then you can probably find their public key if you are yep. targeting them. Yep. Mm hmm. That's terrible, Muriel. Terrible. Terrible. Um, I know, for instance, like uh, Ubico had a had a statement over on their blog mm. about it. Um, I forgot to read that. I'm sorry. No, that's not a problem. Let's get to that. Um, here it is. Quoting their um, their blog their uh, post. Millions of smart cards in use by banks and large corporations for more than a decade have been found to be vulnerable to a crippling cryptographic attack. That vulnerability allows hackers to bypass a wide range of protections, including data encryption and two-factor authentication. 
At this time, we are not aware of any customer breaches due to this issue. We are committed to always improving how we protect our customers and continue, continuously invest in making our products even more secure. So we'll see how this goes. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm, I'm glad. Yeah, it's nice for them to have that write-up because that was the first thing I thought. I was like, I wonder if YubiKey see these. I have a couple sitting around. I don't, they're not actually really involved in a lot of my secure workflows, but it was one thing I've been considering um, as a project this year. So uh, it's nice to see that they, you know, they acknowledge this forthright. Uh, okay, well, anything else you wanted to add here about this uh, kind of interesting uh smart card vulnerability? Yeah, if you've got smart cards, now is the time to check and see yes, where definitely. they're from. And yeah. I think just, uh, yeah, where they're from, and that just seems like a good, you know, understand what your roots of trust are, where they come from, what their history is, and then also I think just it's good to, you know, continually check on these things. If you're, you know, your company or other, you know, organization doesn't have a security officer or otherwise, there are these yep. tasks that need to be done because it's yes. not just a, yes, we trusted it. We figured that out one time. It is, as always, security is a process and it needs to be continually evaluated. Yep. Good luck. Go to Google. Go to Google. Set up a Google alert yep. for the name of the company and the product they use. And you get notified anytime something comes up. And especially if you monitor those incoming alerts, because one day you'll find something very surprising about the <laughs> yeah, company. Right, yeah, exactly. Well said. Good advice, too. Okay, so with that uh, that last story out of the way, we can talk to you about our last sponsor this evening. You were probably worried. You're like, well, maybe I don't trust my smart card so much anymore. And Dan was just talking about some great apps that people can use. You're going to need a phone to run these on or, you know, for various other two-factor authentication means I can think of no better place to run it than Ting. Head on over to techsnap.ting.com and you will find a smarter way to do mobile. Now, that's a big claim, right? A smarter way to do mobile? I thought mobile was already smart. I got LTE, I got gigs and gigs of data and infinite minutes. And uh, yeah, well, how much of that do you actually use? Because Ting does it differently. Rather than locking you into some sort of two-year agreement with termination fees and requirements, and then making you sort of estimate just how much data you think you're going to use on a monthly basis for that entire two-year period, where you have to pay overages if you don't use it, you feel like you're wasting money if you, you know, if you don't use it, you pay overages if you, if you use too much. And a lot of those plans also come bundled with unlimited minutes, unlimited texting, but do you really use unlimited of those resources? How much do you really text these days? It's 2017. Come on now. If you're like me, you don't text at all. You use a couple of minutes. You don't need to pay for these premium plans. Plans that can be, you know, over $100 a month. Ting offers a different model. A model I think and Ting thinks makes more sense. Go on over to the rates page and you'll see what I'm talking about. So here's the difference. Ting is pay for what you use. Yeah, what? Pay for what you use? That sounds too simple to make sense, but it really does. It's it's beautiful. Lines start at just $6 a month. Then they've got a bucketing system here. Uh, it's pretty simple. The page is interactive, so you just get to click around and see what your bill might be. If you don't use any minutes, that's $0 a month. Maybe you, you know, maybe you use a couple. Grandma wants to call you. You need to, you know, you need to call in to a few services sometimes. 100 minutes, probably do ya. That's $3. Three dollars. Same with text messages. Three dollars. And then if you're on Wi-Fi, I don't know about you, but where I live, Wi-Fi is kind of everywhere. It's in the grocery store. It's at my office. It's at my house. Certainly, it's on the bus. It's on the the light rail. It's everywhere. Um, so maybe you use a gig. Maybe a gig. Probably more like five hundred megs. Maybe more. That's fine. If you use five hundred megs, let's say that's twenty-two dollars a month. Twenty. Two dollars. That's one meal out to eat, and that's your whole cell phone bill for the whole darn month. Plus, when you go to techsnap.ting.com, you're going to get a $25 service credit. So it'll probably pay for your whole month's bill, at least the first one anyway, which is pretty great. The other thing about it is that they have all the features you want. They have three-way calling, voicemail. They work with just about everything they have. So they the way it works is Ting resells other carriers. They don't have to play this game of putting up polls and, and doing all this maintenance on the network. They outsource that. What their goal is to be simple, easy to use, mobile that makes sense. 
that's the difference, right? So they have real humans. You can call them. Go talk to a real human. They've got a crazy intuitive dashboard. They've got a fantastic app that lets you do everything. So you don't have to call someone up because you want to activate a new line. That's insane. Plus, how are you going to do that if you don't have a cell phone? That doesn't make sense doesn't make any sense just use the app you can deactivate reactivate they resell both cdma and gsm so whichever one's better in your area or maybe you want both not a problem and because lines are just six dollars each it's super simple maybe you have a nanny uh, maybe you have people who take care of your house where you're out of town you really just want to make sure that you can reach them when you need to super simple it couldn't be easier because it's just six dollars a month that's not a huge cost you can easily eat that it's not a huge deal Plus, since it's pay for what you use, tethering is included. Tether if you want to. It's not. It, they're not going to fine you. You're not going to break your contract because there is no contract and there is no early termination fee. You just pay for what you use. It's not a magical different data bucket that's, that's somewhere else. None of that. You just pay for what you use. You use more this month? That's fine. When I go on vacation or you're going on a road trip, you're going to use more. But as an adult, you just pay for what you use. And then the rest of the year, since you don't use that much, it really makes up for it. So... Whether you have a device that you want to bring, you can go check their uh, BYOD page to go check. They have an IM. Uh, just type in your IMEI or MEID number. That'll see, you know, if your device is compatible. It almost certainly is. Or head on over to their shop. They've got the latest and greatest. And Dan was just talking about iOS devices. Go pick up the Apple iPhone 8 Plus just added. I'm sure they'll have the 10 when that's when that's out. Or a Samsung Galaxy S8 Plus if that's your game. Maybe you're looking at those new Pixels, the Pixel 2. Not a problem. Go buy it straight from Google. Bring it over to Ting. Won't be an issue. You can buy SIM cards there too from starting from $9. So there's a ton of options. It really just makes sense. Or even if you just want to use it for data only, maybe you have a LTE card in your laptop, that's a great use of Ting too. So head on over, techsnap.ting.com. Thank you very much to Ting for sponsoring the TechSnap program. And uh, go tell us about all the awesome things you use Ting for. And that brings us to the next segment today. That's right. It's time for the feedback. We take some time out of the show. Yeah, we've got a lot of stories to cover, but there's always time for you, our favorite, the audience. First up, we've got a little bit of lighthearted feedback from our friend Jonathan. You heard about all the crack troubles, WPA2 vulnerabilities, the security issues with Wi-Fi. Thankfully, though, he's got a simple fix. That's right. An Ethernet cable. How about that, Dan? Will that work for you? Yes, it does. In fact, all the laptops I'm using right now are on WPA2, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they all are. There's one in the living room that's wire wired in at the moment because it's running a backup, but everything else here is Wi-Fi. But I know that these have been fixed, so excellent. I think we're good. Yeah, right. Yeah, there we go. Once you got your patches applied, you can go back to being mm. relatively secure. There's a good feedback thing for next week. Listeners, have you patched your Wi-Fi units yet? Yeah. Do you know if there is a patch coming out? I'd also be interested to hear, like, you know, patching stories. Was it difficult to confirm mm -hmm. with your vendor? Were there vendors mm -hmm. that you just couldn't get information mm -hmm. about? All of that would be fascinating to hear about. I was fortunate because uh, the guy that is a FreeBSC maintainer for Unify, the Unify app for the um, Ubiquity apps I'm using. Right told me first thing Monday morning, oh, yeah, the patch is out. Yeah, nice. Oh, really? Okay. That's great. So you just had to go up and get the latest firmware, yeah. get them to go update themselves. He, and He supplied the URL. <laughs> Even I better. looked in the URL. There was the link to the patch. I started up Unify, went into the, 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 the device, clicked eventually to, you know, update from this custom URL. Mm -hmm. Okay, go. And it, it was done Monday morning. <laughs> I was very pleased. That's awesome. Yeah, that makes it that makes it super simple. I know I've also seen a lot more people somewhat like after this whole revelation, they're now more interested in the the, um, the Ethernet over power line adapters that some people use when they have you know older mm. homes or apartments that don't have Ethernet built into the walls. Um, yeah, I have not use those personally. I don't know how no. well they work, but uh, it sounds like at least some people like them. Hmm. And I do certainly know it depends. I've on I don't know what the latency that, yeah. pro profile is like, uh, but I do know sometimes when you're on that hardwired connection, you're like, ah, I don't. When you, if you want to roam, Wi-Fi is great, but it's sometimes real nice to just have that physical cable connection. Yes, uh, I I don't like the idea of plugging a, a 120 volts into my laptop. 
Yeah. It's different with a power adapter, though. But over the Ethernet, I'm, I'm, You're sketched I'm out. morally opposed to it. <laughs> yeah. uh, the more we learn about Dan every week, I love it. Um, okay, well, thank you, Jonathan. That was great. Uh, audience, if you have feedback on that uh, or, or any of our requests, please do let us know. We'll move right along to our next letter from Russell. Russell writes about snaps for Windows. Now that you could have Ubuntu-flavored Linux in Windows, what are the chances of crafting a program and being able to run it everywhere? Maybe even in OS X someday? Thanks for the great content, guys. This is something we've talked about in a few of the other programs, especially like uh, Linux Unplugged, that Linux is kind of becoming the, uh, you know, like the, the runtime of choice in that you have you have Linux proper, uh, and now you have this win- Windows subsystem for Linux so that uh, you can make it work with graphical apps. I've seen some people do that. These days, it mostly seems like developer-focused command line apps are what the primary use case for the subsystem for Linux is. And, of course, other systems um, like Lumos at FreeBSD, you know, have Linux compatibility layers already. So it does seem like, a, you know, if you're going to target something and you, for whatever silly reason, can't just make it cross, uh, you know, cross OS from the get-go, Linux is kind of the, the platform to beat. What are your thoughts on this? At first, I thought he was talking about, you know, how can I run Linux on OS X? I was thinking VMware Fusion or something mm-hmm. like that. But no, that that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about, writing a program and having it run on any platform. Um, it, it's still very difficult, like a little shell script maybe, but I don't know how you're going to get all of the various graphic things yeah, to Yeah, the work. graphics libraries are really what it, you know, unless you're using um, a, an already very well-developed cross-platform uh, toolkit. I don't know how well, does QT work pretty well yeah. on, or Qt, that, excuse that's me? That's what I was thinking of. Yeah. That's what I was thinking of is QT. Um I keep hearing about it, but I've never written anything with it. Uh, I think the Bacula Bat program mm. compiles with Qt, but I, I I don't use that either. Yeah, yeah. So far, it seems like uh, you know either if you can if you can target OS X natively, then do that. Um, otherwise, mm-hmm. building for Linux and then just you know having a good test suite and other things that won't work. You know, see if it is compatible with the FreeBSD. Um, compatibility layer uh tested on the windows subsystem for linux there does seem to be some developments but uh, i wonder if there's any possibility of porting some of the freebsd compatibility layer to os x not that mm. not that apple has a huge incentive to do so i mean maybe well, they would for some developer areas but i don't i don't see them doing it uh you can compile a whole lot of stuff like it's called homebrew or yeah, i forget definitely. the other version of it on os x but um, that's how most people get Linux programs on OS X now. That's how I run Bacula FD on, on my laptop. Yeah. Seems like a nice ecosystem, too. I know I've used it. I don't have any Macs personally, but I've certainly used them a lot in the past. So uh, Homebrew was much appreciated. Oh, yes. Um, and, of course, more and more things keep migrating to the web, too. So uh, if you don't need local things, it's, it's pretty easy to talk to web services or other things once you've got, you know, curl and the programming language of your choice. But maybe that's not what Russell was talking about. I'm not 100% sure. So, Russell, let us know if we misinterpreted what you were saying. And if anyone else has thoughts about Russell's, uh, you know, thoughts on how the best to target multiple platforms at the same time, thoughts about being able to target Linux and run everywhere and where that might be going, we're interested in all of it. But we must move on. That's how the feedback segment works. It's got some momentum. Just like Oliver's question about server layout for Linux with LXC. I have a Linux-related question that I want to share with you. I know BSD is better. Hey, that's uh, that's a... Uh, no, we don't have to be better or worse over here. We can just say that we like all kinds of cool open-source Linux opera- or Unix-based operating systems. But since I'm a Linux guy, you know I don't I don't want to ask Noah. Hey, I will say Ask Noah is a great program. There's no reason not to. He's a super great guy. Go ask Noah. Yeah, why does he not want to ask Noah? Yeah, come on. I mean, it's great that you're providing us feedback. Don't get me wrong. I think that's fantastic. Thank you very much, Oliver. Uh, But, you know, there's no reason. Noah's great, too. We can collaborate on this in the true spirit of open source. Uh, Anyway, here we go. I have several Linux uh, installations running on DigitalOcean droplets. Hey, yo! Shout out to a sponsor uh, that I'm very, very happy with. That's great. Unfortunately, we have a new security policy requiring me to move these into our data center. What, so I want to set up a host with LXD or LexD. Uh, my requirement is to have a redundant setup. So my question is, 
how would you manage the boot partitions? Since I'm not so worried about downtime, right now I would throw in two small SSDs and clone them after the setup. If one fails, I reboot on the other. All data will actually be on a ButterFS RAID. I know how to store the data of the containers on the RAID. Do you know how I can get everything else on there, like the metadata of the containers? Any ideas or tips? Well, I think I think for LXD, LXC, most of it's under like var lib LXC or LXD. So I think in that case, it's mostly just a you know file system mount point issue. Just make sure that that all of those locations. I'll have to go look at some of the documentation that they have to make sure that that is actually the case. But I think in in, in most of those cases, like Docker systems, most of the, the newer container setups, um, it's it's all runtime stuff ends up under like var lib, you know, the program name. Uh, so in that case, just make sure that that is, you know, is mounted is a ButterFS file set or other similar thing. ZFS, I think, would also work uh, even better here if you're on a, you know, Ubuntu or a similar system where it's relatively easy to get ZFS on Linux up and running. I think that's a great choice. Um, so you're talking about what I'm a little confused is that you want to have a redundant setup, uh, but you're not too worried about downtime. I even if you're not worried about downtime, I would just say that if you can, you know, it's always nice to have more than one machine just because that is going to be a really nice level of redundancy uh, in terms of just, hey, if one goes down, even if does, even if you don't have all the, all, all the data there, if you have backups that you can restore to a second machine, that's going to be a good situation to be in. What are your thoughts, Dan? Well, when I first went researching this, I found the League of Extraordinary Dancers Oh, boy, you had so much more fun than I did. No fan. And I, I was positive that that was not the right thing. But that was interesting. So I don't really know much about Linux containers. I, I know that they're trying to solve a problem that seems to be already solved with BSD, but he doesn't want BSD, well, FreeBSD, but he doesn't want FreeBSD. And I'm just not, I'm not convinced of containers. I think maybe they're trying to solve a different problem and they're not understanding what the problem is. It's not that difficult as far as I know to, to just package up systems and install them. Not on FreeBSD. Uh, what are the problems that they're having on Linux that don't exist under FreeBSD? Or is it a whole different set of problems that they're trying to solve? Uh, no, I mean, I'd like, I, I think there's, I'd like there's to know, but I don't have time to investigate. <laughs> Maybe we can do um, a, a deep dive on an upcoming episode, do some comparisons between between jails and the various Linux solutions and what the use cases are. Because that might be interesting because you have a lot of good, um, you know, personal jail experience for the workflows you have. And maybe we could model that and see, like, how would you do that in the Linux world? And then what are some use cases in the Linux world? And how would you do that in the FreeBSD world? Because I think, honestly, I would have a lot of fun talking about it. Um, okay. As for the we'll like, do that. for the re- the redundancy, um, yeah, I mean the boot the boot partition. It, I guess it does depend a little bit. The biggest issue you're going to have, I think, is with like with the kernel uh, keeping the kernel and the init ramfs up to date. So it depends. It depends heavily kind of here on what OS you're using. You could probably set up some whatever system builds uh, or runs hooks after your kernel gets updated or updates your init ramfs. Uh, if you can supply your own hook that then copies it to your backup boot partition, that would work. Or other, maybe it's a cron job or other scheduled system that does that. Otherwise, it's pretty easy. And maybe you don't even need that too. Maybe if you know, maybe if you're comfortable with having your bootloader be able to read from your your data volume and you keep your kernel in or MFS there, then really I think what you do is you just install Grub or whatever else on both of your boot drives, and you should be good to go. By and large, if you don't like the kernel is is mainly the point thing that changes in these cases. Uh, maybe even less so if you're on an LTS kernel. But but in any case, if all you're doing, especially if it's UEFI, it's probably not. If you're on some sort of virtualized data center situation, it's probably still BIOS. But, you know, it's it's pretty simple. You just really can write it one time. As long as you have all your kernel parameters right and your bootloader can read the file system that your kernel's on, I think it should be good. And then having having a redundant boot setup uh, is, is probably good enough. I would still advise, like, if you can, it's always nice to have two, you know, two systems yeah. running on physically different hardware if you really are concerned about redundancy. Uh, maybe that's not actually the use case that you're concerned about, though, Oliver. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what he means by a redundant setup. Does he mean if one system fails, the other one can take over as in high availability? Or and you, are they both going to be in the same data center? Right. 
or does he mean if a hard drive fails, everything's okay? Yeah, exactly. Very different things. I mean, obviously both are important. So if you have any clarifications, feel free to write back in, uh, you know, re- refining some of your requirements yeah. and we will comment further. Um, I, I think he may mean the drives because he talks about boot partitions and two small SSDs and cloning. So it may be storage that he's talking about. Yeah. And it also depends, you know, it's always too like, what's your, what are your uptime requirements? Because you could certainly do, and it's probably worth doing, but you could certainly do all of this, um, you know, this boot partition stuff. But if you have like IPMI or otherwise, it depends like, is is the bootloader failing really your biggest you know, your biggest potential pain point in this system um, versus being able to, like, if you have IPMI or Pixie or other systems that can just help you, you know, get booted up real quick to get access to your data, maybe it's not so important. It really depends on what your actual requirements are. So uh, let us know about that, and hopefully we can provide more insight. insight and uh, we'll also try to do some coverage about uh, LexD, jails, etc. in the future. Yes, please. Uh, okay, so you also want to talk about cloud ABI here. I totally oh, forgot yeah. about that. Yeah, um, this came from um, uh, Alan Jude, who who mentioned it. And so there's a whole set of cloud ABI um, projects. And there's actually a FreeBSC cloud ABI man page. And and I'm I'm not really sure how this all works in, but apparently it just works. Um, Ed uh, Schouten is the guy who is associated with this page. And he gave a talk at uh, BSC CAN 2015 about this. Um, and if you search for uh, FreeBSD Cloud ABI, you will find a, a link to the FreeBSD page. And I'll add that to the show notes. Nice. Um, yeah, I like this free- summary here. Uh, Cloud ABI is what you get if you take POSIX, add capability-based security, and remove everything that's incompatible with that. The result is a minimal ABI application binary interface consisting of only 49 syscalls. Uh, it doesn't have its own kernel, but instead, this ABI is implemented on existing kernels. So FreeBSD has cloud ABI support for both x86-64 and ARM64. Mm-hmm. There's a patch set for NetBSD and a patch set for Linux. So here is another route, maybe, um, talking to kind of both questions here that you can use to target here's one abi you can build against and then if you have the patches on the on top of your kernels run on multiple different operating systems sounds pretty cool i haven't played with it myself but i remember watching at least one talk on it i think that mr jude also shared uh and it's really fascinating work yeah i I don't know how how would use it or anything like that i don't know enough about it to be able to say yes yes that's what you want but at least read all this stuff and you should be able to figure out if this is what you want. Exactly. Good advice, sir. Okay, so moving right along. Here we've got feedback from the coding cowboy about the IT land before time. Hey, guys. I heard you didn't have any feedback last night. Last week. Last night, what am I saying? Uh, I love the show. I don't want to see it go without feedback, so I found something that might be interested. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate that. How did programmers learn to program before there were computers everywhere? You know, I mean, on your desk, lap, pocket, phone, com- appliances, everywhere. Well, here are a couple of links that I thought you might like. Um, so we can go through these. Believe it or not, Linux and FreeBSD have emulators for some of these, these links that I have for the Cardiac computer. FreeBSD calls the package sync and has an assembler. Um, anyway, this is fun. I thought I would just share. Uh, have a fun. Coding Cowboy. Thank you very much. Let's dive right into these links. So first up, computers that never were. Yeah, this one's pretty cool. It's basically you go in and, and you learn computer theory by working on computers that don't that 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 aren't real computers. Interesting. I like it. Oh yeah. So bit so basically, um, I remember doing a lot of uh, uh, theory early on, <clears throat> and <laughs> you'd write code that didn't actually run on a real computer. It would run on an emulator, um, which would eventually run on a real computer. But you were learning how to program uh, a generic computer. Right. You can have a simplified, uh, you know, instructional, if you will, instruction set uh, that kind of you can learn from, but you don't have to deal with maybe the idiosyncrasies of real x86 Mm -hmm. or whatever else. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, there's a bunch yeah. of interesting stuff over here at this uh, Hackaday article. He also linked to, or she, we don't know, could be either gender cowboy here, the Cardiac Computer. Mm-hmm. Software emulation for the cardboard illustrative aid to computation. Interesting. So this goes back to the Bell system. I'm not really familiar with it, but uh, it looks interesting. And it sounds like there's emulators available for FreeBSD and on Linux. So this could be another old-timey system that you could that you could take a peek at. And maybe it's still fun to learn some of the basics of you know how computing works at the low level. Uh, I know I've seen some... Isn't there some sort of a, like you write like a Tetris type game started, like you write an OS to run a, mm. run a game. Yeah. I forget what that's called. Yeah. There's a yeah. whole class built yeah. around it. Yep. Um, it sounds familiar, but Tetris is a good, you know, coding a Tetris program, a really good way to learn how to do a lot of stuff. Yeah. And it's just like all of these really make you think about just the, the crazy number of abstractions libraries implementations of different standards and ways of thinking that go on you know from the from the laws of quantum mechanics involved in the silicon all the way up to you know writing a python program to serve web pages it's all running on the same thing they're all kind of interplaying and sometimes you really just need to go back to basics to start to kind of get an understanding i think a lot of people especially these days you can get started maybe you're writing you know you're playing with node or you're doing browser work those are all great and and awesome things to do but it can also be very valuable to take you know go and learn about the opposite side of things pick up some assembler maybe on a simpler system uh do some c programming whatever i don't know what you uh, think. in the middle of this article there's a reference to donald newth who when i was in university was he had the books that you wanted uh he documented a whole lot of algorithms and it was just introductory reading for when you get into very complex yeah. stuff like also that. the creator of the uh, tech type sitting system that uh, many yes of us know and yes love. uh yeah well i'm glad i don't have to use that much anymore <laughs> i miss it it's a lot of fun and they just make the papers are just so beautiful anyway we're getting off topic thank you very much for the feedback there coding cowboy those are some awesome links i hope everyone likes them if there's more things in that category Just send them right on over to us. If you guys liked those links, if you had a fun time, let us know. Um, It's almost like a pre-roundup. So thank you very much. Thank you to everyone who wrote in. If you want to write in, you want to provide us with with info for this uh, this here segment, please do so. Go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash contact. There you'll find a form. Choose TechSnap from the drop-down list. That will will send it right to us, techsnap.reddit.com. Or you can find us both on Twitter. That's it for today's segment. Please do write in, and we'll see you on for the feedback next week. But stay right here. We've got a roundup. And with that, it's time to round out the show with the roundup. The final segment. We didn't have enough time to cover these in depth, but they're still great stories, so we're going to share them right here, right now, with you. First up, This is some good news, at least I think. Android getting DNS over TLS support to stop ISPs from knowing what websites you visit. Hey, that sounds like a great idea. It it is pretty cool. And I I, I like the idea. I've often thought about uh, not using my ISP's uh, DNS servers just for that reason. And in in case you're wondering why... uh, a lot of information can be gained from your DNS queries. They can find out what websites you're going to, possibly how often you're going to them. Um, some web browsers do a little bit of DNS caching. I know that Chrome does. Uh, some operating systems do some caching. I know that OSX does and Linux does. FreeBSD can. But basically, people are, are, are getting more concerned about privacy, especially since certain government agencies have decided that it's okay for your ISPs to sell your personal data. Uh, They may not, you may not want to let third parties know what websites you're visiting. Yeah. Um, And even in this day of, you know, HTTPS everywhere, those DNS requests are still flying out there in the open. Yes. Yes. And sometimes that's what matters. Sure. You can't see the page that I downloaded, but you sure saw that I went to sketchywebsite.org and maybe I don't want you to see that. 
th- this is a bit like uh, we're only collecting me- metadata on the phone calls. We're not recording it's the phone exactly calls. Exactly like we're that. just recording the fact that you called this person. You talked to them for ten minutes. Yep. Turns out there's a lot of meat on them bones. Yes. So uh, yeah, over at uh, over at XDA Developers dot com, they've been doing a lot of good work now that they've been doing some. Uh, you know, they've taken on. This owners of doing some news reporting and and other activities. Uh, so they've got the deep dive. If you're curious, if you're an Android lo- user, if you want to learn more, or you're just curious about maybe like, hey, how are they doing this? And can I replicate it on my own network? After I that, do like this. Yeah, yeah, I like it too. And it seems like it's a nice, you know, we haven't, I, I feel like Apple gets a lot and rightly so, uh, but they get a lot of good credit for their focus on security, a privacy, keeping things on device, all the things I like. Um, and, Android certainly had its share of bad practices, security vulnerabilities, other things, uh, at least a majority of which are, are partially related to, you know, the various OEMs that end up rebranding it and distributing it. So it's nice to see sort of like Android, you know, the upstream does care about security too. And here's one of the things that they're working on. Yeah, I'd like I'd like to know more about it. DNS crypt, I think, is a very big deal. Yes, definitely. Um, I, I wish that more people started providing it that's probably something we should touch on on another show as well because we've done we've done some dns stuff but not not really dns crypt or dns sec or any of them the other options yeah and i'd like uh isps etc to not log dns queries yes or at least be like you know it, it feels like it's one of those things where you don't get a lot of it's not really discussed, right? Like, all right, you DHCP'd on your, you know, on, yep. on, on the modem yep. or on your router, and then you got yep. these addresses and you started using them without any sort of agreement or information about what or what not they do log or keep records of. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so if, if there was some sort of like, hey, look, yeah, we support DNS crypt, no problem. Here's our guarantees about what we do and don't log, and here's the retention periods that we are mm-hmm. mandated to have. Mm-hmm. That would go a long way to make me tr- mm-hmm. you know, have a few yeah. a modicum more of trust here. And also in there, you need to know, are they storing any snapshots? Are they storing any backups? Are there any other copies of this data that you're only retaining for 24 hours? Yes, exactly. How, how does it get deleted when it gets deleted? Is it recoverable after it's deleted? These are all Stuff very like good that. questions that make me quite nervous. So good job, Dan. Thank you. Okay, so next up in the roundup, Mercedes handles the competition because it knows how to handle data, too. Mm-hmm. This is pretty cool. I, I'm a big fan of of, of car racing. I, I know a lot know of people that. think. Oh, interesting. Well, I, I, I'm not a big fan, as in I don't. I, I, I'm not so big as that. I watch it. I just enjoy the theory that goes behind car racing. Um, and yeah, we do benefit from the events as they they make on racing teams, not directly, but indirectly. So basically, imagine you've got this car. It's an F1 car, and it's gathering all this information. A ton uh, we, of information. We, we record over 100 times a second with 1,000 channels of data. So that's every second, that's 100,000 bits of data that quickly adds up. They're creating 1.8 million uh, billion data points. So there's 200 sensors in the car. And they generate 500 gig in a race weekend, not just from the car, but from everything that that they do. Um, Now, one of the interesting things is that it's a processor which dates back to 2009. That's ancient in computer world. Yeah. So the team reduced the size of the networking stacks by 70%, enough to make up the device cost with only two years of freight savings. And if you keep the weight down, you save on costs, you can invest in other performance areas. And the more room we save, the more equipment we can bring. Oh, right. So that's so, more data. Yeah. So it is interesting how they do this. And other little thing, like this example I thought was really nice. The driver kept telling the team he felt a cut in the engine. But the guys kept saying, no, you're not, you're not. But they had to keep getting more refined in the data to see it. And it ended up being a one thousandth of a second cut in the engine and the driver could feel it. Wow. And I, I, I find that astounding that it could feel something like that. It was a men, it was a magnetic field the bridge created. So I'm not really sure what that was. Um, it, it's interesting. But basically, 
basically uh, the bit more, uh, the big point here about Mercedes. Mercedes has won a staggering 51 of 59 total races between 2014 and 2016. Yikes. In an era in, in an era where the sport has witnessed an infusion of more money, more engineering talent, etc. So it appears that they're reading their data and taking appropriate action. Doing something right over here. Yeah, definitely. Um, and yep. you know, it's it's like any kind of optimization when you really when you if I really get down to pushing the limits, you you need every last bit of information you can get. Yes. Fascinating. And a, a world they don't right. often t- touch on here on the TechStamp program, yep. but uh, obviously there's a lot of money and a lot of engineering prowess being poured into it. So uh, maybe I'll have to turn it's, my attention there in the future. It's all about the metrics. It's all about the metrics. Oh, I like that. That's a good tagline. I'm going to put that in my back pocket. Okay, so uh, in a totally different world and a little bit less exciting, turns out it only takes about a grand to track someone's location with mobile ads. What is what is yeah. that? What do they mean by tracking your location with mobile ads? Well, what they did is is their their goal is to track a specific phone. Any ad buying spy will have to know a unique identifier of the target phone known as a mobile advertising ID or made. Um, so basically a spy would buy ads against a range of popular apps in the hope that one of them <laughs> would show the ad. And for the second one, they, they, they have a variety of ways to obtain that made, including placing a active content ad that uses JavaScript to pull the made from the phone at a certain location and then that identi- then use that identifier to continue to track the phone with normal ads. So somehow you have to get the phone to expose the maid at the same time that you can then start tracking that maid. So you have your target person get the unique identifier off the phone and then start following that unique identifier. I see. Oh, interesting. So, so even without obtaining the maid, they say some broader spying remains possible. The researchers were able to count the number of people with the Grinder app or the Muslim-focused app Quran Reciter installed at a un- unique location without knowing any unique identifiers. Really? Wow. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Hmm. So how they figured this out yeah so basically they say that ads are not intrusive well it appears that there is a way to be very intrusive yeah definitely i'll also note looks like this uh, research was done over at the university of washington which is uh right in my just backyard. up the road yeah just right. up the road exactly they do a lot of good work over there so this is uh this is interesting and yeah it definitely has some implications i'm sure we'll be hearing more about it in the future mm-hmm Okay, moving right along in the roundup. We got to get out of here. Encryption chip flaw afflicts huge number of computers. This sounds like something almost like we talked about at the start of this it, it, of today's it program. I it, think we have a theme. It, it is. Trust nothing. So it is, it is still Infineon, and it's a trusted platform module. Cryptographic processes used to secure information keys in many PCs, laptops, Chromebooks, and smart cards. So this is the same thing, but it's affecting more than just smart cards because um, the problem was serious enough to demand soft firmware updates from computer vendors, including HP, Fujitsu, Lenovo, Lenovo, Acer, Asus, LG, Samsung, and Toshiba. Uh, So basically, they're talking about the coppersmith method again on a 512-bit key. So basically... This is a big enough deal that it's affecting your laptops, not just the smart cards. So Windows users can check for the presence of TVM by typing uh, win plus R and then trying to run tpm.msc. So if there's not present, you'll see a message stating this. But basically, that's how you go. Um, it's a CV, CVE issued 2017-15361, and there's a workaround but there's a whole lot of devices that are affected. Yeah. And really it's like kind of the worst time because like 
DBMs have been around for a while, but not really used a whole lot. But now that there's a lot mm-hmm. more servers out there booting UEFI and otherwise, um, and now that a lot of you know sensitive government and otherwise workloads have shifted to the cloud, I've certainly seen a huge amount of work, uh, partially on you know Google's doing it, container Linux, uh, Core OS, etc. You know, trying to make sure that you have like verified boot, trusted boot that you can measure hash, ensure that the you know that the operating system that's actually getting loaded by your computer is the one that you have signed and trusted and the mm-hmm. tpm is the root of that trust so when you have a vulnerability there ugh, yikes but, wow that's scary yeah exactly uh but at least we know about it now people can take remediation efforts and we can move on mm-hmm. like we must do mm-hmm. this mm-hmm. one sure made me mm-hmm. think right of you mr dan Yes, yes, yes. Canada's super secret so, spy agency is releasing a malware fighting tool to the public. Now, I'm I'm sure that I know this building. I'm, I'm sure I've pulled up in front of this building really? to pick up a friend for lunch. I'm positive. I'm positive that this is a... a it's an attractive Blair, looking little building at, there. At Blair Road, yeah. That's... I. If this is the building, I think it is. It is right next to the CSIS buildings, Canadian Security Establishment, something. They're, they're the they're the Canada's spies who are very polite. They're not allowed to go covert. They don't. They only do it. They do everything not undercover. So, but the 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 communication security security establishment is the one that does all the securing security around government communications and i know a chap that works there and if you're listening hello see it bsd can nice um now it is it is pretty cool what they're doing here um gchq is the uk version um and they put out something called chef which is a very useful tool and it's entirely standalone it has some feedbacks to Google Analytics that you can strip out and stuff like that. But look up Chef if you're interested in in tools like that. So basically what they're doing here is they're releasing some of its own cyber defense tools to the public in a bid to help companies and organizations better defend their computers and networks against specific threats. We're not going to go into much detail about this, but this is a really cool thing to do. Oh, yeah, definitely. And I like this. I like seeing the, you know, like taxpayer funded efforts go back Mm -hmm. to benefit the public in a really direct Mm -hmm. way. And sure, maybe that's not always possible. I'm willing to concede that. But but when you can, when you can abstract things, isolate things from sensitive information and you have a framework that works without revealing too much OPSEC sort of information, it's great that they're willing to do so. Isn't it? The U.S. government's policy that anything, any data that is collected must be made freely available unless it's, you know, deemed security sensitive. You know, I'm not like, sure about current like, guidance. Like, I know there's been discussion of that. Well, uh, like mapping information and census information oh, right. that yeah. has to be all provided publicly, except for zip codes. You're not allowed to get zip codes. That That really is a purview of the post office. Or am I thinking the Canadian post office? Getting confused. One of them has a copyright on the zip codes or, or the or the postal uh, zones. I'm not sure which one, in, in which you get a whole list of them. One of them has a copyright on it. I can't remember. Oh, interesting. Anyway, this is a good idea. I want to know if someone um, has looked at these and what they think of them and how it is going. Yeah, definitely. I'm also going to say, I think this is a good article over at the cbc.ca, uh, written by Matthew Brega. You can see his picture over on the side there. Based on his skeptical look, I think he might also be a spy. So uh, just just watch out for that. Who? Uh, Who? Which one? Matthew, Which one? the author of this article. If you see his picture oh, over there, he's oh. given quite a leery look over at us. He, maybe he's suspicious of us. I'm, not, I'm, yeah. I'm really not quite sure. Anyway, he's the senior technology reporter. And this is a great article. So thank you, Matthew. Okay. So, um, oh, yeah. Yep. Go on. Uh, they go down here and they they talk that the NSA and GCSQ have active projects on GitHub. So go and look at their projects. They are interesting. Perfect. Okay, so we have one last story today on our roundup. 
And that's yes. over at 3zanders.co.uk, Alex Parker's website. And that's Writing a Bootloader, Part 1. This is pretty cool. Um, bootloaders are, are, are the first part of the, the system that gets the OS running. Um, every computer, and sometimes they are OS specific, but every computer needs a bootloader of some type because that's what actually gets you from dead hardware to getting the OS loaded in. And sometimes it's a multi-stage process where you write this little bit of code that allows you to read even more code, which then allows you to read more code, which then loads the operating system. Because sometimes you don't have enough. You, you can only build yourself up a little bit at a time. And it's also referred to as bootstrapping. And sometimes it can be very tricky. But this is a way for you to start writing one. I think this is a very good way if you've ever wanted to learn how to do assembly language or write a little bit of kernel code try this yeah exactly honestly i find uh, the whole you know bootstrapping bootloading segment to be kind of fascinating uh you do really have to do a lot of work to try to just get everything working out of the gate start this whole thinking yes. rock system that we have and get it to actually run some useful software so it's definitely fascinating there's a lot to learn and it's like a useful bridge sort of application where like you can learn a little bit about like some of the hardware stuff without having to write firmware or anything like that and tie into some of the OS level stuff. It's just a, it's just like a meaty little middle bit there. So fascinating stuff. I think this is a pretty good article getting started. Use this QEMU as well because, Hey, that's a lot more convenient than having to reboot your computer every six minutes to go test your latest change. Yeah. Set. So yeah. Uh, it's a pretty, pretty had, productive workflow. Yeah. I've always had trouble pronouncing that QEMU. Yeah. Always. <laughs> Always. Maybe that's what they want. Anyway, go check that out. That's it for today's roundup. Anything else you would like to leave our dear audience with, Mr. Dan? No. No? Thank We're you. flat out. That's it for today's TechSnap program. This has been 342 on October 24th, 2017. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we very much enjoy everyone's participation. If you'd like to give us some feedback, if you want to see more of the show, jupiterbroadcasting.com and go to the contact page to give us feedback or go to the archive page you can find a bunch more of this show the past incarnation of this show a whole bunch of other fantastic jupiter broadcasting content you know if you're bored you have some free time you're on a long drive or you're just trying to get some stuff done at work go try a new show maybe a show you haven't tried before there's lots of great stuff coming out ask noah i'm just gonna throw it out and ask noah go watch the latest ask noah's they come out on mondays Watch them live. They're a ton of fun. If you've got Linux questions or you just want to throw them for a loop, BSD questions, throw them right over to Ask Noah. It's the perfect place to do so. You can also go you know, find a whole bunch of stuff, the live stream, the calendar, let you know when we're here live, all that great stuff. If you want to find us more, you can go to techsnap.reddit.com or find us both on Twitter. I'm at Wes Payne. He is at techsnap underscore Dan, that's it for this show, but don't worry, we'll be right back next week with another one. Until then, thank you very much and patch your shit. Mm-hmm.